chapter eight of clergymen of the church of england by anthony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the curate in a populous parish would that it were possible to enforce upon the bishops as a part of their duty the task of furnishing annually a statistical report which would show what proportion of the clerical duties in their diocese was done by curates and what proportion by other clergymen and also what payment had been made to the curates for the work so done and what payment to those who were not curates such statement might show us for instance in a tabulated form how many morning services and how many evening services had been performed by each curate how many sermons preached by them how many children baptized how many dead men buried how many marriages celebrated and above all how many cottages visited then if we could see together with all this what amount of the payment received could be justly appropriated to each task performed we would have some clear idea of the manner in which the revenues of the church are divided among those who do the work of the church we all know that no such statistical information is within our reach the bishops are altogether beyond our power and cannot be ordered by any one to do anything the idea of comparing the work done with the payment given for the work would be horrible to the imagination of every beneficed clergyman in the church of england it would be horrible even to the imagination of the curates themselves who like the needy knife-grinder have no adequate conception of the injustice they are themselves suffering and who are as a body so well inclined towards the rules and traditions of the profession to which they belong that they have not as yet taught themselves to wish for a change no clergyman in our church has as yet taken it into his head that there should be any analogy or any proportion between work and wages in his profession as there is such analogy and such proportion in all other professions there is something of revolutionary tendency in the suggestion that clergymen should be paid in accordance with their work which is almost profane to the mind of a clergyman and which vexes him sorely as being subversive of that grand position which he holds as the owner of a temporal freehold the very irregularity of the payments still made to parish parsons and formerly made to bishops half justifies a latent idea that clergymen though they work and receive payment are not labourers working for hire a second son inherits his living as the elder son inherits his estate and the rector who receives his living from his bishop is equally firm in his possession he may be blessed with a thousand pounds a year for doing very little or have two hundred pounds a year for doing a great deal but in either case what he receives has no connection with what he does and therefore no such statistics as those of which we have spoken can be supplied no revelation will be made to us tending in any degree to give us the information for which we ask that there will come an adjustment between work and wages in the church as in all other professions is certain indeed much has been done towards this adjustment already though not after the fashion above proposed the incomes of all bishops have been arranged on such an idea to the great detriment as has before been explained of episcopal magnificence deans and canons have fallen beneath the levelling hands of ecclesiastical political economists and out of the funds which have been acquired by these adjustments and curtailings of ecclesiastical wealth certain incumbents working in populous parishes have received augmentations of pay making their incomes up to the very modest stipend of three hundred pounds per annum but nothing in all this has touched the great body of the clergymen of the church of england or has as yet shown any general recognition of the principle that the hire of the labourer should be proportioned to the labour done in speaking of the work and wages of curates it must of course be admitted that in all professions and all trades the beginner should be contented to work his way up taking at first and being contented to take a modest remuneration for the very best that he can do 
the young barrister does not get fifty guinea fees at once nor does the young medical practitioner jump at once into the good graces of the old ladies and gentlemen who make the fortunes of mature doctors but at the bar and in the profession of physic there is at least some proportion kept the man who gets the most money is generally the hardest worked man or if in some cases it be not so the lower man who works harder than him above him receives something like a fair share of the spoil if he be successful in work he is successful in pay also being successful in work he will not work without success in pay but the curate let his success in work be what it may does not even think that he has on that account a claim to proportionate remuneration if he can get to the soft side of his bishop if he have an aunt that knows some friend of the lord chancellor or a father who has means to buy a living for him and he be not himself of too tender a conscience in the matter of simony then he may hope to rise but of rising in his profession because he is fit to rise he has no hope the idea has not as yet come home to him that he has a positive claim upon his bishop because he has worked hard and honestly in his profession it is notorious that a rector in the church of england in the possession of a living of let us say a thousand a year shall employ a curate at seventy pounds a year that the curate shall do three-fourths or more of the work of the parish that he shall remain in that position for twenty years taking one fourteenth of the wages while he does three-fourths of the work and that nobody shall think that the rector is wrong or the curate ill-used all the world that is to say the rector's friends and the curate's friends also have been so long accustomed to this state of things the bishops have had it so long under their eyes the idea of a temporal freehold in a living being a good thing for the parson instead of a good thing for the parishioner has got such a hold of us all that we none of us see the injustice of the present practice or stop to inquire how it grew up among us originating in a practice that was not unjust when the rectors and vicars were very many among us in comparison to the curates when a curate was needed in but few parishes the ordinary tenure of a curacy was of course short there have been instances no doubt since the earliest years in which curates were employed of curates who have remained curates till they were old men but the succession from the smaller number of the inferior grade to the much larger number of the superior grade was of course rapid and a clerical babe would be contented to take a curacy even at seventy pounds a year who might reasonably expect to be raised from that humble position after a service of uh, two or three years but nowadays since the immense increase of population has forced upon us an increase of curates any increase in the number of endowed rectors and vicars being out of our reach the clerical babe must become a clerical old man on the same pittance and it is coming to pass that young men whose friends have been at the trouble of giving them a good education do not like the prospect of becoming curates without any prospect of rising from their curacies to the glories and comforts of full-blown parsondom and in considering this matter we must remember that the curate of to-day is deprived of a great advantage which belonged as a matter of course to the curate of yesterday the latter was presumed to be by virtue of his calling a gentleman and as such possessed almost a right to be admitted into society which neither his fortune nor his own abilities would have opened to him he was a gentleman as it were by act of parliament and it was understood that he might receive where he could not give and so enjoy many of those good things which a liberal income produces though such things were beyond the reach of his own purse thus the pains of his position were mitigated and in this way the poor clergyman mixed with men who were not poor and received a something from his status in the world to which no disgrace was attached though it was something which he could not return but we may say that all this is now altered a clergyman is no longer a gentleman by act of parliament 
till the other day he was admitted into all families simply because he had a place in the reading desk of the parish church but he is no longer so admitted things have become changed within a few years and mothers are becoming as chary of admitting the curate among their flocks till they know exactly what are the curate's bearings as they have ever been in regard to the new young doctor till they have known his bearings under these circumstances all men who care for the church of england are beginning to ask themselves how the race of curates is to be continued let us for a moment look at the life of a curate of the present day we will suppose that he comes from some college at cambridge or oxford we will so suppose because cambridge and oxford still give us the majority of our clergymen though we can hardly hope that they will long continue to be so bountiful he enters the church moved to do so by what we all call a special vocation during the period of his education he feels himself to be warmed towards the teaching of the english protestant church and as he finds the ministry easy in his way he enters it and about the age of twenty-four he becomes a curate he is at first gratified at the ease with which are confided to him the duties of an assistant in the cure of souls and does not think much of the stipend which is allotted to him he has lived as a boy at the university upon two hundred a year without falling much into debt and thinks that as a man he can live easily upon seventy pounds hitherto he has indulged himself with many things he has smoked cigars and had his wine parties and been luxurious but as a curate he will be delighted to deny himself all luxuries his heart will be in the service of his god and his appetite shall be to him as thorns which he will make to crackle in the fire to eat bread without butter and to drink tea without milk is a glory to him and so he begins the world and for a year or two if he be not weak-minded things do not go badly with him the parson's wife sees far into his character and is kind to him stirred thereto by a conviction of which she is herself unconscious that the money payment made by her husband is insufficient the dry bread and the brown tea are still sweetened by reminiscences of st paul's sufferings and the young man consoles himself by inward whisperings of forty stripes save one five times repeated to be persecuted is as yet sweet to him and he knows that in doing all the rector's work for seventy pounds a year he is being persecuted but anon there grows up within his breast a feeling in which the grievance as regards this world is brought into unpleasant contact with the persecution in which he has a pietistic delight he still rejoices in the reflection that he cannot possibly buy for himself a much-needed half-dozen of new shirts but is uncomfortably angry because the rector himself is not only idle but has bought a new carriage and then he gives way a little the least in the world and at the end of the year owes the butcher a small bill which he cannot settle from that day the vision of st paul melts before his eyes and he sighs for replenished flesh-pots but he still works hard in his curacy perhaps harder than ever driven thereto by certain inward furies what will become of him of him with his seventy pounds a year and nothing further to expect as professional result if he be deserted by his religious ecstasy but religious ecstasy will not permit itself to be maintained on such terms and gradually there creeps upon him the heart-breaking disappointment of a soured and an injured man in the midst of this he takes to himself a wife it is always so the man who is most in the dark will be the best inclined to take a leap in the dark in the lowest period of his despondency he becomes a married man enjoying at the moment a little fitful gleam of short-lived worldly pleasure then again he is a male saint for a few months with a female saint beside him and after that all collapses and he goes down into irrevocable misery and distress 
in a few years we know of him as a beggar of old clothes as a man whom from time to time his friends are asked to lift from unutterable depths of distress by donations which no gentleman can take without a crushed spirit as a pauper whom the poor around him know to be a pauper and will not therefore respect as a minister of their religion in all this there has been very little and we may say nothing of fault in the curate himself as a young man almost as a boy he placed himself in a position of which he knew the old conditions rather than those then existing around him and through that mistake he fell but young men are now beginning to know and the fathers of young men also what are at present the true conditions of the church of england as a profession and they who have been nurtured softly and who have any choice will not undergo its trials and its injustice for men of a lower class in life who have come from harder antecedents the normal seventy pounds per annum may suffice but all modern churchmen will understand what must be the effect on the church if such be the recruits to which the church must trust End of chapter eight chapter nine of clergymen of the church of england by anthony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the irish beneficed clergyman the difference between an irish and an english parson is greater perhaps than that which exists between irishmen and englishmen of any other special denomination and is of a nature exactly contrary to that which generally marks the distinctive character of the milesian and the john bull the normal irishman is a jolly fellow but the normal irish protestant clergyman is a severe sombre man one who speaks of life in sad subdued tones unless when he is minatory in the pulpit one who looks at things around him with a continual remembrance that life is but a span long that men are but grass of the field that the sickle is ready and the oven heated and that it is worth no man's while to be comfortable here on earth he is preaching every moment of his life preaching in his gait preaching in every tone of his voice preaching in every act that he does preaching in every turn of his eyes find him asleep and you will find him preaching with a long protracted indignant low church protestant snore very eloquent as to the scarlet woman but an english parson let him be ever so much given to preaching preaches only from his pulpit he may scold advise or cajole in the school the cottage or in the drawing-room but he keeps his sermons for his sunday work an irish clergyman does not shake hands with you without leaving a text or two in your palm with his own special comments on their tenor as regards the pope the reason of this is not far to seek the irish clergyman does not live in the midst of protestants with whom he sympathizes but is surrounded by roman catholics with whom he cannot sympathize and against whom he is driven to feel almost a personal enmity not only by reason of their creed which he sorely hates but by reason also of the anomalies of his own position which are so hateful to them he is always in a state of feud in a state of feud not only against the devil as should be the case with all of us whether clergymen or laymen but against antichrist on the seven hills against the scarlet woman who goes about devouring against the pope who is to him a ravenous old woman as to whom he cannot say whether he is most ravenous or most old womanish against a creed which has for him none of the attractions of christianity in which he sees only the small points of divergence from his own and which is therefore worse to him than the creed of mussulman or of jew he is therefore always serious as is a soldier who is ever buckling on his armour and somewhat sad as is a soldier who cannot get his enemy down so that he may take away his standard and trample on him the irish protestant clergyman is ever longing to lead troops of the roman catholics of ireland in triumph to the top of the tarpian rock of conversion but they succeed in bringing thither but one another and these one and another are such that they hardly grace the chariot-wheels of their victors 
the popular idea of an irish clergyman in england is we think somewhat incorrect he is often supposed to be an idle man listless for want of occupation given to self-indulgence ill-educated eager only in defence of his temporalities and warmly attached to the party politics of protestants rather than to their religion such men may doubtless be found among the holders of livings in ireland as they may also in england but such is not the general character of the irish clergyman he is a man always active though unfortunately his activity has but small field of usefulness his air is not the air of a listless man but of a man disappointed as it may well be as he goes on in life he may come to love too dearly his slippers and his armchair and perhaps to feel as disappointed men will feel will feel but not acknowledge that the consolations of the dinner-table are and that none others are reliable but such is not his normal condition of body or mind i will not say that he is generally well educated because the word means so much but the irish clergyman has generally read as much as his brother in england though his reading has been of a different nature of reading applicable specially to his own profession he has probably endured more than his brother in england in short he is more of a clergyman and less of a man of the world than the english parson with this misfortune that his clerical activities are always at work against enemies and not on behalf of friends there would not be space for me to say much in this short sketch of the now acknowledged anomalies of the position of the church of england as established in ireland but i will endeavour to describe the outward form and bearing of the clergyman whom these anomalies have produced begging my readers to believe at the outset that the irish clergyman may be regarded nine times out of ten ninety-nine out of a hundred i think we might say as a sincere man as a man with strong convictions who has no shadow of doubt in his own mind that the surest road to heaven if not the only one is by that special pathway of which he professes to have the clue there is no reservation within his mind as to his religion with its intricacies being good for the ignorant for instance though perhaps not altogether needed for the educated he has no doubts the eureka with him is a certainty that men will be saved and will be damned as they live remote from or attached to papistical teachings is to him a reality now it is something that a man should be capable of a sincere belief and that he should succeed in attaining to it the irish beneficed clergyman has almost always been educated at trinity dublin and has there been indoctrinated with those high protestant principles with which he has before been inoculated he is of course the son of an irish protestant gentleman and has therefore sucked them in with his mother's milk he goes before his protestant bishop and takes his orders with the corps of other young men exactly similarly circumstanced and thus he has never had given to him an opportunity of rubbing his own ideas against those of men who have been educated with different proclivities he has never lived at college either with roman catholics or with presbyterians or with protestants of a sort different from his sort in his cradle at his father's table at school at the university in all the lessons that he has learned in all the games that he has played in his converse with his sisters in his first soft faint whisperings with his sisters friends in his loud unreserved talkings with his closest companions the same two ideas cheek by jowl have ever been present to him the state ascendancy of his own church and the numerical superiority of another church antagonistic to his own when we consider all this and look at the training which the irish clergyman has undergone how can we wonder at his idiosyncrasies irish clergymen are thus bound together more closely than clergymen in england chiefly from the want of opportunity for divergence not only education goes always in the same course but the circumstances of professional career attach themselves very closely to one form 
the livings are more generally in the gift of the bishops than with us and the irish bishops perhaps are more inclined to give promotion solely on the score of merit than are the english bishops there is we believe less of church patronage or rather of the exercise of church patronage for the furthering of private ends and if this be so the irish church in that respect is superior to our own but as the irish curate is to get his living from the irish bishop and is to receive it as a reward for his clerical zeal and not because he is his father's son it is absolutely incumbent on him to work as a curate up to the established diocesan mark and this mark or standard will not be the standard fixed exactly by the bishop himself bishops predecessors and bishops chaplains and the very air round the bishop's residence will have been for years impregnated with high protestant principles and even a bishop who may himself be lacking in that fiery protestant zeal which is regarded as church of england orthodoxy in ireland will not find himself able to subdue the strength of the atmosphere in which he is called upon to live there have been bishops sent to ireland nay there still are bishops in ireland placed over dioceses there because they have been considered to be we will not say anti-protestant but liberal in their tendencies towards roman catholics and presbyterians but the clergymen who come forth ordained from under the hands of the liberal whatleys are nearly of the same form as those who from time out of mind have been given to us by the orthodox trenches and the orthodox beersfords the stream runs too strongly to be stemmed by any bishop so that the irish clergyman who desires to swim must almost of necessity swim with it the clerical aspirant becomes first a curate one would be disposed to think that there could be no great need for curates in ireland that is the population of the country is chiefly roman catholic and as not much above one half even of the protestants conforming to the church of england so that the proportion of even nominal churchgoers is less than one in eight and as there is a beneficed parson in every parish whether there be much little or nothing to do curates could not be needed in addition to rectors and vicars but curates seem to be as common in ireland as they are in england the souls of men requiring we must suppose more surveillance and the work we must presume being more closely done the young clergyman almost always becomes a curate and then looks to his bishop for a living depending thus on the bishop he lives strictly works with energy is constant in his adherence to all the exigencies of his cloth and in the ripeness of time is blessed with a living of we will say two hundred and fifty pounds a year with a glebe irish livings are thought to be very good but the value here named is above the average in the rich diocese of meath perhaps of all the irish dioceses the richest the endowment of more than one half of the livings is less than the sum above mentioned then begins the real battle of his life of course our irish clergyman marries and of course he has a family and even in ireland the support of a wife and family upon two hundred and fifty pounds a year is not easy his glebe is probably remote from any town and far removed from the houses of other gentry the parish squire is a personage who as such hardly exists in ireland here and there a resident landowner is to be found with a large house and a wide domain but the parish squire who has interests in the parish almost identical with those of the parson does not exist the clergyman therefore located in the country lives alone and his nearest neighbours are the rectors and vicars of other parishes he lives alone and the solitude of his life does not tend to make him jovial or even satisfied with things around him but he has his religion and he tells himself that that should suffice for him that that should be all in all to him he has his religion and he endeavours to make the most of it it is to be not only his guide through life to things spiritual but his chief comfort in things temporal he must abide by it in every phase under which it has been presented to him he must hang to it as the politician does to his party he must trust to it 
not merely for the god and saviour whom he knows through its assistance but for his very politics thoroughly believing that all its doctrines and all its formularies are essentially necessary and that they must be taken with the exact tenets and with all the twists which have been given to him by his side in church disputes of all men the irish beneficed clergyman is the most illiberal the most bigoted the most unforgiving the most sincere and the most enthusiastic he is too often an unhappy man being poor aggrieved soured by the misfortunes of his own position conscious that something is wrong though never doubting that he himself is right aware of his own unavoidable idleness aware that when he works he works to little or no effect feeling that prayers said and sermons preached to his own family to three policemen and his clerk cannot be said to have been preached to much effect it is a lifelong grief to him that in his parish there should be four hundred and fifty nominal roman catholics and only fifty nominal members of the church of england but yet he is staunch there is a good day coming though he will never see it he consoles himself as best he may with the certainty of the coming triumph but cannot refrain from sadness as he tells himself that it certainly will not come in his days there is nothing more melancholy to a man's heart nothing more depressing to his feelings than a doubt whether or no he truly earns the bread which he eats the beneficed clergyman of the church of england in ireland has no doubt as to his right to his bread as to his right either by the law of man or by the law of god but he cannot but have a doubt as to his earning it he tells himself that it is the fault of the people that it comes of their darkness that he is there if they will only come to him but they do not come and he has on his spirit the terrible weight of wages received without adequate work performed it is a killing weight to preach to three policemen is as hard as to preach to three hundred educated men and women nay perhaps it is much harder but he who preaches feels that his preaching is nothing he is as the convict labourer who moves sand from one hole to another and who can get no comfort from his work and he is daily told this irish beneficed clergyman of the church of england that of all men he is the most overpaid newspapers which he cannot but see speakers on public platforms to whose orations he cannot entirely stop his ears are telling him constantly that he is a drone growing fat upon honey which he does not help to make threatening him with parliamentary annihilation and invoking against him all the ardour of all the radicals in the meantime he knows that he and his are barely able to subsist on the pittance which the church allows him he has terrible temporal grievances in poor rates charges for his glebe deductions on this side and on that till he knows not how to pay his butcher and his baker and the wife of his bosom is driven to painful stringent economies he has not he tells himself half of that which a liberal church in old days had intended for the parish and yet they tell him that he is robbing the public he is there to do his duty why do not the people come to him for what he receives whether it is much or little he is ready to work if only his work might be accepted but his work is not accepted and there is no slightest sign in ireland that it will be accepted the anomalies of the church of england in ireland are terribly distressing and call aloud for reform but to none can they be so distressing as to the beneficed clergyman in ireland and in the behalf of no other class is that reform so vitally needed End of chapter nine chapter ten of clergymen of the church of england by anthony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the clergyman who subscribes for colenso 
we have heard much of the broad church for many years till the designation is almost as familiar to our ears as that of the high church or of the low church but the broad church of former times some twenty years ago we will say when the ecclesiastical world was all on fire because the then prime minister was minded to give a mitre to a certain professor of divinity at oxford held doctrines very far indeed behind those to which the liberal parsons of these days have made progress the ordinary broad church clergyman of that era was one who showed himself to be broad by his tolerance of the doubts of others rather than by the expression of doubts of his own he was not uncomfortably shocked at finding himself in company with one who was weak in faith as to the old testament miracles and listened with placid equanimity to discussions which went on around him to show that our ancient bible chronology was defective but now we have got much beyond that the liberal clergyman of the church of england has long since given up bible chronology has given up many of the miracles and is venturing forward into questions the very asking of which would have made the hairs to stand on end on the head of the broadest of the broad in the old days twenty years since there are bishops still living and others have lately died who must have been astonished to find how quickly their teaching has had its results how soon the tree has produced its fruit the free-thinking clergyman of the present time is to be found more often in london than in the provinces and more frequently in the towns than in country parishes they are not many in number as compared with the numbers of all parsondom in these realms but they are men of whom we hear much and they are sufficiently numerous to leaven the whole there are many things gone recently altogether out of date which the meek old-world clergyman dares no longer teach though he knows not why the placid easy-minded clergyman who would be so well satisfied to teach all that his father taught before him the actual six days for instance the actual and needed rest on the seventh but the placid clergyman dares not teach them not knowing why he dares not he has been leavened unconsciously by the free-thinking of his liberal brother and his teaching comes forth conformed in some degree to the new doctrines although to himself the feeling is simply that the ground is being cut from under him and that that special bit of ground the actual six days has slid away altogether from the touch of his feet in london and in the large towns where they most abound these new teachers have their own circles their own flocks their own churches and their admirers who have become familiar with them and it is when so placed no doubt that they are most efficacious in operating on the education of laymen and of other clergymen but it is when such a one finds himself placed as a parson in a country parish out as it were alone among the things of another day that he calls upon himself the greatest attention he has around him antediluvian rectors and pietistic vicars who regard him not only as a bird of prey who has got into a community of domestic poultry but worse still as a bird that is fouling its own nest they hate his teaching as all teachers must hate doctrines which are subversive of their own which however they can themselves neither subvert nor approve but they hate more intensely that want of professional thoroughness that absence of esprit de corps which these gentlemen seem to them to exhibit he has taken orders says the antediluvian rector speaking of his free-thinking neighbour to his confidential friend simply to upset the church he believes in nothing nothing in heaven nothing on earth nothing under the earth he told his people yesterday that the book of exodus is an old woman's story and the worst of it is we cannot do anything to get rid of him no by heaven not anything to which the rector's confidential friend replies that the rector has still the power left of preaching his own doctrine bah says the rector preach indeed preach the devil as he does and you can still fill a church any day what i want to know is how a man like that can bring himself to take four hundred a year out of the church when he doesn't believe one of the articles he has sworn to 
now the special offence of the liberal preacher on this occasion was a hint conveyed in a sermon that the fourth commandment in its entirety is hardly compatible with the life of an englishman in the nineteenth century and the laymen around are astounded by the man feeling a great interest in him not unmixed with awe has he come to them from heaven or from hell are these new teachings which are not without their comfort promptings direct from the evil one who is ever roaring for their souls and who may thus have come to roar in their own parish there is mystery as well as danger in the matter and as mystery and danger also when not too near are both pleasant the new man is not altogether unwelcome in spite of the anathemas of the neighbouring rector what if the new teaching should be true so the men begin to speculate and the women quake and the neighbouring parsons are full of wrath and the bishop's table groans with letters which he knows not how to answer or how to leave unanswered the free-thinking clergyman of whom we are speaking still creates much of this excitement in the country but in the town he is encountered on easier terms and in london he finds his own set and has no special weight beyond that which his talents and his energy can give him it is very hard to come at the actual belief of any man indeed how should we hope to do so when we find it so very hard to come at our own how many are there among us who in this matter of our religion which of all things is the most important to us could take pen in hand and write down even for their own information exactly what they themselves believe not very many clergymen even if so pressed could insert boldly and plainly the fulminating clause of the athanasian creed and yet each clergyman declares aloud that he believes it a dozen times every year of his life most men who call themselves christians would say that they believe the bible not knowing what they meant never having attempted and very wisely having refrained from attempting amidst the multiplicity of their worldly concerns to separate historical record from inspired teaching but when a liberal-minded clergyman does come among us come among us that is as our pastor we feel not unnaturally a desire to know what it is at any rate that he disbelieves on what is he unsound according to the orthodoxy of our old friend the neighbouring rector and are we prepared to be unsound with him we know that there are some things which we do not like in the teaching to which we have been hitherto subjected that fulminating clause for instance which tells us that nobody can be saved unless he believes a great deal which we find it impossible to understand the ceremonial sabbath which we know that we do not observe though we go on professing that its observance is a thing necessary for us the incompatibility of the teaching of old testament records with the new teachings of the rocks and stones is it within our power to get over our difficulties by squaring our belief with that of this new parson whom we acknowledge at any rate to be a clever fellow before we can do so we must at any rate know what is the belief or the unbelief that he has in him but this is exactly what we never can do the old rector was ready enough with his belief there were the three creeds and the thirty-nine articles and above all there was the bible to be taken entire unmutilated and unquestioned his task was easy enough and he believed that he believed what he said that he believed but the new parson has by no means so glib an answer ready to such a question he is not ready with his answer because he is ever thinking of it the other man was ready because he did not think our new friend however is debonair and pleasant to us with something of a subrisive smile in which we rather feel than know that there is a touch of irony latent the question asked troubles him inwardly but he is well aware that he should show no outward trouble so he is a debonair and kind still with that subrisive smile and bids us say our prayers and love our god and trust our saviour the advice is good but still we want to know whether we are to pray god to help us to keep the fourth commandment or only pretend so to pray and whether when the fulminating clause is used we are to try to believe it or to disbelieve it we can only observe our new rector and find out from his words and his acts how his own mind works on these subjects 
it is soon manifest to us that he has accepted the teaching of the rocks and stones and that we may give up the actual six days and give up also the deluge as a drowning of all the world indeed we had almost come to fancy that even the old rector had become hazy on these points and gradually there leak out to us as to the falling of manna from heaven and as to the position of jonah within the whale and as to the speaking of balaam's ass certain doubts not expressed indeed but which are made manifest to us as existing by the absence of expressions of belief in the intercourse of social life we see something of a smile cross our new friend's face when the thirty-nine articles are brought down beneath his nose then he has read the essays and reviews and will not declare his opinion that the writers of them should be unfrocked and sent away into chaos nay we find that he is on terms of personal intimacy with one at least among the number of those writers and lastly there comes out a subscription list for bishop colenso and we find our new rector's name down for a five-pound note that we regard as the sign to be recognized by us as the most certain of all signs that he has cut the rope which bound his bark to the old shore and that he is going out to sea in quest of a better land shall we go with him or shall we stay where we are if one could stay if one could only have a choice in the matter if one could really believe that the old shore is best who would leave it who would not wish to be secure if he knew where security lay but this new teacher who has come among us with his ill-defined doctrines and his subrisive smile he and they who have taught him have made it impossible for us to stay with hands outstretched towards the old places with sorrowing hearts with hearts which still love the old teachings which the mind will no longer accept we too cut our ropes and go out in our little boats and search for a land that will be new to us though how far new new and how many things we do not know who would not stay behind if it were possible to him but our business at present is with the teacher and not with the taught of him we may declare that he is almost always a true man true in spite of that subrisive smile and ill-defined doctrine he is one who without believing cannot bring himself to think that he believes or to say that he believes that which he disbelieves without grievous suffering to himself he has to say it and does suffer there are the formulas which must be repeated or he must abandon his ministry altogether his ministry and his adopted work and the public utility which it is his ambition to achieve debonair though he be and smile though he may he has through it all some terrible heart struggles in which he is often tempted to give way and to acknowledge that he is too weak for the work he has taken in hand when he resolved that he must give that five pounds to the colenso fund or rather when he resolved that he must have his name printed in the public list for an anonymous giving of his money would have been nothing he knew that his rope was indeed cut and that his boat was in truth upon the wide waters after that it will serve him little to say that such an act on his part implies no agreement with the teaching of the african bishop he had by the subscription attached himself to the broad church with the newest broad principles and must expect henceforth to be regarded as little better than an infidel certainly as an enemy in the camp by the majority of his brethren of the day why does he not give up his tithes why does he stick to his temporalities says the old-fashioned wrathful parson of the neighbouring parish and the sneer which is repeated from day to day and from month to month is not slow to reach the new man's ear it is an accusation hard to be borne but it has to be borne among other things by the clergyman who subscribes for colenso end of chapter ten end of clergyman of the church of england by anthony trollope